Good afternoon, Lace Chapman. I'm John. This is Betty Atruda. Welcome to Fallout 4 as well. Let's see if we can figure that one out. You see, uh, there's so much I love in Fallout 4, but there's also plenty that doesn't work. And to properly evaluate the game, we have to acknowledge both. And this time, we actually are starting at the beginning, because uh, at the risk of showing my hand a bit early, I think I've figured out one of the key reasons uh, that so many folks have a negative view of the game. You only get one chance to first impression, and the opening of Fallout 4 is a bit of a mess. So, uh, let's start there, shall we? The opening to a Fallout game has a lot of heavy lifting to do. You've got an alternate universe full of huge amounts of backstory, covering centuries of fictional US history, which has a massive impact on the game's world. So, you've got to get some of that over without getting bogged down with info dumps. And that's just setting up the world. Then, there's whatever you want as your new plot, the focus of the main quest. Plus, you've got a game that's both very complex in terms of its mechanics and changing a lot next to its predecessor. So, there's a lot of practical mechanical things that need to be tutorialised. Though, uh, as for what sort of things ought to be introduced to the player, well, in a game with building, looting, gunplay, exploration, trading, crafting and more, that's a difficult thing to answer. The point I'm making here is that the more complicated the game is in terms of both narrative and mechanics, the more crucial it is that the opening of the game works, giving the right information in the right order, so that both experienced Fallout fans and newcomers can get into the meat of the game as fast as possible. And I think Fallout 4 does really drop the ball on this. Just a quick reminder, here's literally the first information that the game gives you about the world you're going to start the game in. But then, in the 21st century, people awoke from the American dream. Years of consumption led to shortages of every major resource. The entire world unraveled. Peace became a distant memory. It is now the year 2077. We stand on the brink of total war. And I am afraid. Okay, so that's promising. Bethesda isn't just treating the pre-war world as a retro future wonderland that got bombed into being a nice skybox. We're acknowledging that things have been slowly going to hell for years. They don't explicitly use the terms, but fans will recognise the references to the resource wars and the war in Anchorage. The war against China is already on and the protagonist appears to be aware and concerned that the apocalypse could be any day. Great, that's a brilliant place to start. Let's see how dark the final days before the bombs fell were, as society breaks apart. Ah, good morning, Mum. Your coffee. 173.5 degree Fahrenheit. Brewed to perfection. Oh, okay, so, um, everything's fine, actually. Plenty of food, car outside every house, robot servant that needs fuel to operate. Well, thank goodness I was worried by that resource crisis you mentioned 30 seconds ago. But I guess there isn't one actually, so... Why did you just mention the resource crisis, by the way? Uh, it's that salesman again. I don't know why he keeps bothering you. Wow, you're really not keen to speak to the salesman from the underground apocalypse shelter company. Hey, weren't you saying you were scared of the apocalypse 30 seconds ago? Listen, after breakfast, I was thinking we could head to the park for a bit. Weather should hold up. You know there's a plague, right? Started by the accidental release of the US's own biological weapons. I know Bethesda knows this, because they put it in Fallout 3. And Fallout 4 too. McCready's son has it. It really does feel like the opening section was written in isolation from the rest of the game. Why is there this sudden whiplash between the collapse of America and uh, no wait it's all fine actually? Like, I don't object if you want the point of the opening to be your life was so good, then the bombs fell, now it's all gone, that's fine. But if that's your play, don't start the game by telling me about crisis and war. Speaking of which, you've got a fixed character background for the first time in a Fallout game. Either a soldier or a lawyer, depending on which gender you pick. Now that's actually really cool, because when I heard about that for the first time, I immediately thought, well, that's a couple of really interesting careers for people in 2077. A soldier may well have seen action in Anchorage. They've been exposed to a live war. And I know Bethesda knows that, because they literally just showed me a man looking really sad in Anchorage, while talking about how the world unraveled. And then there's, um, the other stuff. 
how the US military rounded up people of Chinese origin and sent them for medical experimentation, the FEV experiments that the army oversaw, how literally the first thing you see in the entire franchise is US soldiers laughing as they execute a Canadian prisoner of war in the street and then wave to the camera because this was public knowledge. I'm so proud of him. But I guess everybody's fine with that, I suppose. The law is super interesting too, of course. The world of Fallout is full of political corruption, government overreach, and appalling mistreatment of workers. So examining how hard it would be to uphold the law in a country where everyone with power and money just ignores the law at will, that's a great story. Good old US of A. Oh, okay, I guess she's just fine with all of that, actually. The whole backstory is a bit weird because it literally never comes up again. He's no better with guns, she's no better at persuasion. I don't think they ever mention their careers again. Their skills are entirely a function of character build. So why do they even have careers? Why doesn't the game generate a career based on your character build? You know, like Fallout 3 and the GOATs. But before you have time to think about what an odd bunch of narrative choices have just played out in front of you, the bombs are dropping and it's time to run to the shelter so we can watch our partner die, our baby get kidnapped and emerge into our destroyed neighbourhoods. And let's pause there for a second. Your partner's about to be executed in front of you. Now, presumably, you're supposed to be sad about that. So, what do you actually know about your partner going into the execution? Let's list everything. One, they are either a soldier or a lawyer. That's it, actually. Hilariously, you're never told their name. It defaults to Nora if you're not playing as her and Nate if you're not him. But if you haven't got the subtitles on, the game never says this. So you just have an unnamed partner who you, presumably, love. You have no idea what their personality is, but you're sad they're dead, or should be, I suppose. And as for your neighbourhood and dear neighbours, well... Uh, I guess you can read the mailboxes to figure out what their names were. This, I think, is all a mistake, and the issue is the game's in a rush. Fallout 3 gave itself a bit of time in the vault to set the scene, to let you get to know a few folks, get a feel for your dad's personality, build up an idea of what your own character was like, how they dealt with their problems, how they would react to a form of bully needing assistance, whether you'd risk your own safety to help a friend, tiny dilemmas and choices that quietly nudge you into a Fallout way of thinking. Character, choices, consequences, the basics of roleplay on a small scale. But Fallout 4 doesn't have time for that, because Fallout 4 wants to shove a nuke straight in our faces. I don't know who made this exact direction choice, and I can't find any statements on what the intention behind Fallout 4's frenetic opening was, but I think it's a mistake for one simple basic storytelling reason. It's very difficult to have an emotional response to character drama if you don't know the characters. We're not sad Nate dies because we don't know anything about him. We're not sad to see our home in ruins because we only live there for a few seconds. We're not sad to see our neighbours' corpses because we never even knew who they were. And the weird thing is, somebody spent some time giving our neighbours some post-war character in death. One of them built their own bomb shelter and set up a sniper spot on the roof. Another set up a barricade and died behind it defending their house in unknown circumstances. Another was secretly a drug dealer. Wouldn't seeing the neighbourhood destroyed, the houses gutted, the folks who couldn't get into the vault left dead on the ground, wouldn't that all be a lot more powerful if we just spent a few minutes with them before the bombs fell? If you're feeling really fancy, we could even have a super easy first quest to let you meet the neighbours. You could even have an extra slot in the vault assigned to your family in error, so you could pick a neighbour to come with you through the gate. There's so many ways you could have given the player a bit more attachment to your partner or neighbourhood before nuking it. But instead, it's straight into Vault 111. Now, my opinion on 111 has swayed a bit over time. It's a very small and simple vault next to the previous generation, but it's also very easy to forget how ridiculous some of the Fallout 3 and New Vegas vaults actually were. These confusing mazes make no sense. The vaults were originally designed to be small, with a simple layout that's efficient and easy to follow. I can do without Fallout 1 and 2's approach of having them all be completely uniform, though that is probably the most realistic take. Vault 111 is a reasonable middle ground in size, and I'm not going to drag the game for having the first tutorial dungeon be fairly simple. I'll even overlook the slightly basic vault experiment, which appears to just be, can you freeze people? Because it does at least make sense in the context of the vault's true purpose as a testing ground. 
Admittedly, the exact nature of the societal preservation project was a bit vague in old Fallout, but from Van Buren through New Vegas and Nuka World, the best bet seems to be it was a test for how people reacted to various extreme circumstances in sealed environments, to see what the best way to get people off world and into extraterrestrial colonies might be. From that perspective, testing cryogenics on some random disposables, yes, that makes sense. I do also have my own little pet theory, but this is entirely my own reading of the text. Given the US government could have tested cryogenics at any point, what if the actual vault experiment wasn't whether the pods were safe? What if it was actually whether a small team of scientists and security could be trusted to keep the pods safe? An experiment that yielded useful data in 111, as the scientists and security fell out and ended up killing each other, leaving the residents to die, an outcome that would have been a disaster if the people in the pods had actually been important. There is at least enough room for interpretation that I think 111 is a solid enough if somewhat simple vault. So, back outside and back to Sanctuary Hills, where, after tutorializing movement, sprinting and basic combat, it's time for something new. It's time to talk to Codsworth. Okay, let's discuss speech. Okay, let's start with the basics here. At the highest level, why is speech in Fallout important? Simple, the universe of Fallout is complicated and features centuries of lore covering pre-war and post-war eras. Some players are gonna love this level of rich detail and want every scrap of backstory they can get their hands on. Some players don't, they just want what they need to know for their immediate situation. And of course that changes over time. A player on their second playthrough might not want to hear lore they're already familiar with, and some areas might just naturally interest you more than others. This makes a traditional Fallout speech system a solid solution that suits everybody. You can either simply ask what to do next, alternatively, you can go down a branching rabbit hole of chatting about factions, history and Caesar's personal philosophical framework. From that exact starting point, however, I can see how a rework of speech might have looked like a good idea to Bethesda, creating a consistent experience where one button, A, always moves the conversation on positively, while another button, Y, always seeks further detail. But it just doesn't work in practice, and the reasons are so blatant and visible it's kind of shocking this iteration made it into the final game. So, in Fallout 4, you always have four options, because now the UI insists you have four options. And the issue is just staring you in the face. What if four options isn't the right number for the conversation you're having? Sometimes you'll run into shops where you don't need four options. You just need yes I want to buy or no I don't. So there's pointless duplication, where maybe just means no. At the other extreme, however, when you're speaking to a faction leader, important people with power and influence, whose ideas are going to change the Commonwealth, leaders of factions, who you may or may not choose to back, the interactions you can have with them are hugely limited. And one of the biggest of these limitations is it made it pretty much impossible to integrate perks into speech because there simply wasn't space for them. Now that's a huge loss because before Fallout 4, skills had two key purposes. One, they represented your actual abilities in practical skills. Two, they opened up appropriate skill-based speech options. And that's really important, because having skills you'd specialised in being represented in dialogue was one of the big ways you could roleplay in Fallout. It gave the character you were building representation in narrative as well as gameplay. A medical expert could provide advice as a doctor, or a science expert could impress other researchers with their knowledge. It was a lovely touch and a really important part of what made Fallout feel like an RPG at all times. But when the transition to Fallout 4 came and skills were blended into perks, Gameplay-wise, I think it all works very well, like we were discussing last time. But the representation of skills within conversation was almost entirely lost, with only a tiny handful of exceptions. If you've taken the perk Ghoulish, it offers literally no extra dialogue when speaking to ghouls. Party Boy does nothing when speaking to folks in a bar. Science does nothing in the Institute. Power Armor perks do nothing when speaking to a woman whose primary job is maintaining power armor. It's a huge loss and one that massively undermines the sense of an RPG in narrative terms. Because even though you have a lot of freedom to build a character however you want in terms of game mechanics, those choices are almost never represented in the narrative. Instead, perks are now purely utilitarian. They give a gameplay bonus that is precisely what they say they're going to do and nothing more. But let's get back to those four buttons because it gets worse yet. 
Now that the four options are supposed to be pre-designated, and we do have the exact designations that Bethesda were using, thanks to this document being shared in 2016, we can see that asking for information is now restricted to one option. One question which the game picks for you. Sometimes a second question is available after the first. Sometimes the first question just loops. Conversations in general are much shorter as a result. For example, consider the first time you run into Preston Garvey, who wants you to jump into some power armour and mow down some raiders outside. Here are some things you might reasonably want to know. Why are these raiders attacking you? Can we negotiate with the raiders or pay them off? Why aren't any of you jumping into the power armour? Can I have any weapons or ammo? Are any of these civilians able to contribute to the fight? Are there any other Minutemen or sympathetic factions that might come and help us? Plus, remember, this is literally the first human who's been willing to speak to you since leaving the vault, so you'd probably have a lot more things to ask as well. These reasonable questions, however, aren't available to you, because the speech options you have don't allow it. Now, there are countless examples of situations where you can't ask logical things you might wish to know, but the problem's not just the Y button. Oh no, all four buttons have their issues. Like, say, the complete gamble of sarcasm, which can mean anything between enthusiastic assent and the odd, needlessly cruel remark. Look at me. I'm a ghoul. A freak. Don't take this the wrong way, but you were pretty ugly before. And that's also part of the wider issue, where the brief summaries on each button make it very difficult to know what you're about to say. Always believed in freedom of the press. And naturally, it's much harder to roleplay when you can never be sure what tone your character is about to use. It's self an issue of having a voice protagonist. Now the lines are only read how one voice artist chose to read them, not how you choose to interpret them. But now we're starting to home in on the real issue. The buttons lie. Yes, no, and neutral are completely, demonstrably untrue. When somebody asks you to do something in Fallout 4, yes means yes, neutral also means yes, and no means yes but not right now. And you can tell this is the case because if you actively say no and walk away from a character, sometimes the game just updates the quest as if you said yes anyway. Plenty of the time, you'll pick up miscellaneous tasks without even speaking to anybody. Just getting close enough to overhear that something needs to be done is enough for Fallout 4 to add it to your to-do list. Now this is a huge deal because it completely changes what speech means in Fallout. Traditionally, when you spoke to a quest giver, you were using the information they gave you to inform a handful of key decisions you have to make. Do I want to help this person? Would I rather help somebody else instead? How precisely might I be able to help them? And is this an appropriate thing for my character to get involved with? Fallout 4 doesn't think about quests in the same way. Quests are just a thing that needs to be done. Why? Because they yield rewards in terms of caps and XP. Rewards are good, so here are a bunch of speech checks to negotiate the exact reward, and then off you go. And I think it is very telling that there are more lines of dialogue dedicated to the exact cap reward you're asking for than about asking for the full context of what you're doing. In Fallout 4, the quest giver is not trying to persuade you of the practical, factional, or moral benefits of you helping them. They're offering you a contract you're pretty consistently treated like a low-rent mercenary. Go here, kill everything, and I will give you money and XP. As a result, plenty of quests, in the absence of a meaningful reputational karma system, lack any narrative consequence. But why does Fallout 4 work this way? Why is it the quests are just assumed to be positive things you should do without asking questions, as opposed to the result of careful consideration about what your character wants to achieve? Well, the tragic thing is, uh, I suspect none of this was just an unfortunate mistake. You see, shortly after the game came out, we had some great opportunities to hear about some of the thinking behind the game. In particular, Fallout 4's lead designer and writer, Emil Pagliarulo, gave the keynote speech at the story conference just after Fallout 4 came out. The whole thing is really fascinating, but let's focus on a couple of key design decisions that were highlighted there. One particularly fascinating statement he made was that while they could have filled every quest with huge amounts of narrative detail, something he refers to in his talk with the shorthander The Great American Novel, he made the active decision to not do this because uh, players are going to rip out every page and make paper aeroplanes out of them, and they're going to throw them around the room and they're never going to see your story because they're going to spend 30 hours making shacks and 20 hours looking for bobbleheads. That's the jagged pill we swallow when we do this. 
So, as best as I can tell, what he's saying is that many players won't engage with every bit of lore you put into an open world game, so therefore, there's no point putting in that much lore. Instead, narrative and conversations should be streamlined, a point reinforced by another design principle he stresses in the same session, keep it simple stupid. And I can't help but feel this is a pretty serious misreading of large parts of the Fallout community as it was in 2015, between the huge lover for New Vegas, the long-standing fans of Fallout 1 and 2, and, uh, as we pointed out last time, the huge success of various old-school RPG Kickstarter campaigns uh, that led to a resurgence in lore-heavy traditional RPGs in the years leading up to Fallout 4's release. It is, to my mind, uh, a very confusing statement, Especially when every previous Fallout game already had a dialogue system that was well suited to containing large amounts of optional lore that you could dig into if you wanted, but also skip if you didn't. But again, why? What's the point of consciously choosing to cut down on the volume of narrative and streamline conversations? Well, to answer that, we're going to need to have a wider discussion about quests and factions. Fallout 4's opening is really kind of bananas. The idea that one hour in, you'd be wearing power armor and fighting a Deathclaw is pretty much unthinkable in any other Fallout game. After all, these are big, important, iconic parts of the franchise that deserve to be treated with respect. And clearly somebody in Bethesda agrees because a lot of work has gone into reworking the power armor. How it feels like a walking tank, a vehicle you're driving, rather than a slightly better version of combat armor. I like that it has its own specialised perks, its own craftable parts that grant unique bonuses, its size and design, there's a lot here that's really nice. But as soon as you give it to a level 2 character, the genie's out of the lamp. There's enough fusion cores around that I've seen plenty of folks saying they pretty much wore power armour the whole game. And as soon as that's the case, well, you've got a game balance issue. So Bethesda had to create a weird diminishing return damage resistance curve, so that power armour wasn't too overpowered in the early game, meaning that actual damage reduction in Fallout 4's power armour is often less than a decent set of everyday armour in Fallout New Vegas. Plus, handing it over so soon does rather steal some excitement that could have been saved for later in the game, like seeing power armor for the first time when you meet the Brotherhood, or doing a quest to build your first set by yourself. That could have been a really fun and thematically appropriate Brotherhood quest, for example. And then there's the Death Claw, which was done dirty by Fallout 4's introduction, which again is a shame, because as I discussed last time, its design and movement is beautiful, it's a really cool enemy. But just remember how Death Claws were introduced in Fallout 1. In the harbour, most people don't even believe they exist, and the few people that do are terrified of them. A single one has been destroying entire caravans, and after speaking to a series of locals, you finally find someone willing to take you to the creature's lair, an ominous dark cave with a monster hiding within. The point I'm making is, there's a lot of build-up, it's a big deal. Death Claws were so rare in Fallout 3, you could complete the entire base game without ever seeing one. In New Vegas, they're treated as an impenetrable natural barrier, forcing the courier to make a massive detour to get to the strip. And here's where we can start putting together a coherent theory about why all of this is as it is. Because this feeds into what we were discussing before. Just like the introduction of the game, rushing you to the vault instead of giving you time to explore and understand the pre-war world you came from, Fallout 4 is often in a hurry to get you in the action. Fight bugs, fight mole rats, fight these other bugs, fight raiders, fight more raiders, finally get to a conversation with a faction leader, which pushes you as fast as possible to doing even more fighting so you can get to the Deathclaw Power Armor minigun showdown. The whole intro seems to be built around a rapid series of escalating fights to form an exciting action-packed opening. This isn't just wild speculation, this is something we do actually have some insight into. In 2018, character artist Jonah Loeb provided a fascinating bit of information about Concord and the game's opening, as he recalled finishing work on Fallout 4's Deathclaw design and showing it to Todd Howard. Two days later, Todd returned to my cube and let me know they were restructuring the demo to include a final Power Armor vs. Deathclaw battle. Now the term demo is interesting, given Fallout 4 never actually had a demo, so this might refer to a build that was available to some publications around E3 2015, or it might just mean the gameplay that was shown off in the E3 presentation. 
The important thing, however, is that it appears Bethesda's leaders want to have a big exciting fight between someone in power armor and a Deathclaw to show off early in the game, at the end of a series of escalating fights. And this is really unusual for a Fallout game. You see, every Fallout game before Fallout 4 broadly begins the same way. You give the player a town. Shady Sands, Klamath, Megaton, Good Springs. Why? Because towns are the natural environment for Fallout games to happen. There's people to talk to, local issues to solve, shops, companions, all the stuff that makes up a Fallout game. And like we were saying earlier, a Fallout game's introduction is doing a lot of heavy lifting. It sets the tone, it introduces the mechanics, it gives us an idea what's more or less central to this iteration of the Fallout universe. So, the absence of a traditional Fallout town until you reach Diamond City is potentially a worrying sign, depending on your perspective. It suggests that there's a less immediate focus on NPCs, on quests, on conversation and world building, and that supposition is backed up by the simplified and reduced dialogue system. It also means that a lot of early game focus falls on the very first faction you meet, Preston Garvey and his Minutemen refugees, with his alliance building quests being one of the first in the game. And I think this is a mistake, but not in the way most people think. Preston's become a bit of a meme over the years, so generally criticism of him is limited to him being annoying and putting things on your map. I'll mark it on your map. Yep, that's the one right there. But I think his memification unfortunately means that people miss the real issue with the Minutemen, which is uh, they were introduced far too early in the game, given their mechanical and narrative function. Let me explain with a simple example. In New Vegas, you're starting Good Springs. In the town, there's a crisis between Ringo and the townsfolk and the nearby Powder Gangers. This conflict can be solved in all sorts of ways, uh, joining either side uh, with the potential result that there are only a handful of survivors. And the reason that New Vegas can give you so much freedom to deal with this problem however you want is because neither faction really matters. You may well never return to Good Springs again, and there's only a couple of Powder Ganger camps in the entire world. It's pretty much a consequence-free environment because it doesn't really matter if you completely mess up and get everybody killed. Next up, you're introduced to the NCR and the Legion. Mess with them and the consequences are a bit more severe, as anyone who's run into a Legion hit squads to low level can tell you. But New Vegas does two things to show a bit of mercy to new players. During the game's first act, no faction will ever shoot you on sight, no matter how much they hate you. And at the end of the first act, all negative reputation from the two main factions is removed. In short, you're given a second chance. After that point, if you become hated, this time they will start shooting you on sight, and there are no more do-overs. You just have to accept the consequences of your actions. And if you still go on to mess up everything and alienate or kill everybody, well, Yes Man's there as a final backup, with an in-universe explanation for his immortality, so there's always going to be a way to get an ending. The key thing here is the order things are introduced in, Begin with a low stakes conflict so the player can experiment, see how factions and reputations work, figure out how much freedom they have and how much consequence there is, and then start introducing primary factions in a controlled way, with a failsafe option introduced last. Fallout 4 does this literally backwards. The first faction you run into is a major faction, the source of one of the game's four endings. But the really big issue is this, Preston Garvey is Yes Man. He's the failsafe ending. If you mess up everything else, you can always finish the game with the Minutemen. And that means he can't die. And this has created a very unfair complaint I've seen many times. Oh look, it's Bethesda and their essential tag again. And this is straight up factually wrong. Fallout 4 is actually really happy to let you kill everybody and live with the consequences. Murder Dance, you can never ally with them or do any of their quests again. Nuke the leadership of the railroad the very first time you see them. That's the railroad dead. You can even shoot Sean in the face the moment you find him without ever finding out who he was. And then just shoot your way out of the institute. The game's fine with that. But most people don't realise this because, perfectly naturally, the first time they run into a faction, they drop a save, put a few bullets into Preston's head, realise he can't die, so they just assume everyone else is essential too. It's such an awful idea to put the failsafe faction up first, because it literally teaches people the wrong lesson about freedom and consequence, and gives them an unrepresentative view of how the world works. 
And speaking of unrepresentative, let's talk about the Minuteman quests. Now, as we discussed last time, I conceptually like these missions because thematically they make a lot of sense. Solving local problems, doing a bit of building, putting together an alliance of independent holdings. Their missions feel a lot different from the Railroad or the Brotherhood, and that's good. The problem is, you don't know that at the beginning of the game, because the Minuteman missions are introduced within two hours of starting, and the Brotherhood Railroad and Institute missions won't be fully available until the second act, maybe six to ten hours in. Just imagine the point of view of somebody brand new to Fallout. Fallout 4, their first ever experience of this universe. You run, you fight, you fight, dog, you fight, you fight, you fight, you fight, brief chat, you fight, you fight, 10 minutes of building, you finally get given a proper mission. They ask you to go somewhere else and kill some raiders, that thing you've just spent the last hour doing. They say thanks, you go back to Preston, he tells you to do it again. What does that teach you? Well, quests aren't very interesting. There's almost no narrative component to them. You may well spot they appear to be procedurally generated because there's no proper voice acting and the farmers you're helping don't have names or personalities. As a result of that, I have every sympathy for people who play the first two hours of Fallout 4 and come to the conclusion, wow, this isn't an RPG at all. This is a competent shooter with dull procedurally generated missions, unkillable NPCs and really limited narrative, and it doesn't feel at all like previous Fallout games. That would be a perfectly fair conclusion to draw from the evidence in front of you, because the introduction just front loads the very worst bits of the game, context-free shooting, unkillable NPCs with nothing to say, and the most generic missions in the game. The first mission that the Minutemen give you isn't even the most fleshed out of the generic settlement quests. Abernathy Farm, Grey Garden, they both have named characters and more voice acting and context, but the game never sends you there first, even though Abernathy is literally the closest settlement to Sanctuary. And again, the thing I absolutely want to stress here, this is completely not representative of much of the rest of the game. Take Covenant, for example. It starts with a fun quiz. There's a mystery to solve. You can investigate with special checks or just searching the area, picking locks, hacking terminals, scavenging for passwords or pickpocketing folks. There are speech checks, multiple endings, moral choices. It's a really solid, well put together Fallout quest. Or the Silver Shroud, say, which, while linear, has a bunch of fun writing and voice acting to give it a lot of flavour. Your crimes have gone unpunished for too long. What the hell's wrong with you? And a lot of ways to deal with the final confrontation, including some fun ones you might not immediately think of, like executing the hostage the boss has taken, which takes everybody in the room by surprise. Diamond City Blues is another great little quest, where, depending on your choices, you may have to split a valuable haul of drugs between yourself and a few other people. And depending on how many witnesses you leave alive, and how many teammates you got involved, there can be a follow-up quest where you have to investigate a murder that you yourself may have been involved with, just to make sure that somebody else takes the fall. There's some fun, intricate stuff here that feels very Fallouty. And in many cases, I don't even mind some of the more linear quests, as the enemy variety and level design make them a lot more fun, like storming Fort Hagen or fighting your way through green tech genetics. One thing worth noting though is, uh, we often discuss Fallout games as if they're produced by a big homogenous Bethesda creature, with people talking about Bethesda Fallout games, like they have a single designer behind them, when we know that Bethesda actually seems to give its quest designers a lot of autonomy, like, we know for example that after a few iterations of a quest set around Salem didn't work out, the then junior quest designer Liam Collins was allowed to just have a go at making something, and he created The Devil's Jew. And as best as I can tell from the available sources, he wasn't given any direction by the lead designer, he just made up something and it's in the game. And just sometimes you can sense all those different hands. In fact, I think Fallout 4 is perhaps noteworthy for being the Bethesda game where you can most feel the influence of different quest designers making very different quests. For example, a lot of people like the USS Constitution. It's a fun mission with two opposing factions, some fun writing, and a whole bunch of special checks that make the whole thing feel a lot more RPG-ish than some other quests. Well, we know that that quest was designed by Ferret Baudouin, who's a relatively rare veteran of Black Isle and former developer on Van Buren back when that was a thing, who ended up at Bethesda, not Obsidian. Now, I can't prove he was responsible for Covenant 2, Bethesda are a little bit cagey about who exactly worked on what, but the two areas do feel somewhat similar, and I think you can sense the influence of a veteran of old Fallout in these missions. 
On the other hand, somebody, and nobody's ever owned up to this, made Kid in a Fridge, an incredibly dumb and short quest that makes no sense on any level. Overall though, I think Fallout 4 does generally have a good variety of quests that are well suited to their factions, or a good solid Fallout fare, or feature some really fun writing. It's just a shame that some of the game's least interesting stuff is right at the start to sour a bunch of first impressions. But again, I think we need to take a step back here because uh, we're getting close to the biggest and most confusing problem in all of Fallout 4. And that means that uh, it's time to talk about focus. In June 2015, Todd Howard walked out onto the stage at E3 and chose a fascinating way to introduce Fallout 4. He showed us a generic panel on the front of a computer console and boasted that Bethesda artists had been concepting every switch and light on every console in the game. And I believe him because there is a huge amount of tiny visual detail in Fallout 4. In the excellent discussion, Fallout 4 VR is not an absolute nightmare, Up is not jump noted that in VR you're much more alert to this level of detail, that the amount of pipes and wiring on the ceiling of the very first room in the game, a room where you have no reason to look up and will almost certainly never visit again, is kind of mad. And this sort of thing happens all over the place in Fallout 4. There are over a hundred magazines in the game, all with really beautiful and unique cover art, the vast majority of them will never be seen by most players, and most people that do find them will see the cover for a few seconds and then never again. They built planes and tankers and hid them at the bottom of the sea when no one has any reason to look for them. Everywhere you look, there's fascinating visual detail. And Todd Howard gave us the exact reason for this sort of thing as he introduced the presentation. It all starts with an obsession to detail that it's all of these small details coming together that form a much, much larger whole. Now that's admirable, and I think you can see this design principle in all sorts of little things, but not all of them. In fact, when you keep this statement in mind, it ends up raising a few confusing questions about what resource was assigned where in the development of Fallout 4, and where the most focus was being dedicated. Because the artists and environment designers knocked it out of the park as far as I'm concerned. It's absolutely obvious that huge amounts of love and attention were put into creating a massive, open, colourful, interesting world. Boston is such a masterpiece because of the work of these folks. But here's the problem, and again I think this is a big central issue to why some folks come to a negative view of Fallout 4. Why does the game feature so many areas, big, beautiful, visually impressive areas, that don't have anything going on narratively? To revisit something I mentioned earlier, in the speech given by Emil Pagliarulo, he explicitly said that too much writing wasn't always productive, and narrative should be kept simple, focused on a core theme. But this feels completely at odds with what Todd Howard is saying was the design principle of the game from his point of view. The game director is telling the artist to focus in and get every tiny detail right, even if it's something that basically no one will pay attention to, while the lead designer and writer wants the quest designers to keep it simple, stupid. And I think this might explain the state of some of Fallout 4's locations. Take Easy City Downs. It's an old horse racing track now used for robot racers, and a huge amount of work has been put into it. The robots do actually run laps. There's a commentator who does discuss the race as it happens. The robots have cute names. The area has been populated with both triggermen and raiders who are neutral to each other. And one note hints that there's some form of scam going on, done by fixing the racers. So that sounds like a great setting for a quest. A mystery to solve, two factions who could be turned on each other. So why doesn't anything like that happen? You can't gamble on the racers. Everybody just shoots you on sight. Why was so much effort put into this area if it doesn't do the one thing that most players will want it to do after seeing it? Why has so much effort been put into making an area look amazing, but in practical terms functions as just another shooting gallery? The most egregious example of this is the combat zone, of course, which the game tries to steer you to. You can walk past plenty of folks that mention it in passing, adding a miscellaneous quest to check it out, and it's very nearby to Diamond City. It's supposed to be a fight club, you see. And in fact, most of the work on it was done and can still be salvaged from the game files with mods. You go in peacefully, choose to fight Kate, let her live when you win, she becomes a companion, and you get to keep fighting in the arena for caps. The club only turns on you if you refuse to fight. But in the final game, nope, 
everyone just shoots you. And it's frustrating and confusing because I really have no idea what was going on with the resource within Bethesda. Did they just have a desperate shortage of quest designers? Because the number of secondary quests in Fallout 4 is really low. If you exclude the main quests and those of the Radiant, Single Stage or Simple Fetch quests, I count 17 and I'm being very generous in including Kit in the Fridge. Now that's a bit odd, because that's the same number of side quests as Fallout 3, and Fallout 4's map is about four times as big. Now, to be fair, there are more main missions in Fallout 4 due to the faction system, but once you consider how many quests New Vegas had, the whole thing becomes a bit baffling, and reveals just how much Fallout 4 is leaning on radiant quests. Easy City Downs, for example, can be chosen at random as the site of no less than seven different radiant quests. But this isn't to say that every area is narratively empty. While there is a strange shortage of quests in Fallout 4, there's also an uptick in stories being told in random locations that have no marked quest associated. In fact, some of these are my favourite stories in the whole game. The Goo in Suffolk County Charter School, the long tale of University Point's last days as they came under Institute siege and turned on each other, the tapes left by a serial killer in the Fen Street sewer meant for a detective long since dead, even tiny stories like the paranoid conspiracy theorist who tried to make his own nuke in his basement, or how you can get a sense of each resident's personality in the Sandy Cove's retirement home. But I also appreciate that it seems to be used as a crutch, standing in for quests in areas that feel like they would have benefited from active quest design. The key difference, of course, being interactivity. No matter how well a story is told in the environment, you're still mainly a passive audience member. Your involvement is limited to finding and interpreting evidence. In a quest, you're an active participant. You can actively engage with what's happening around you and modify the outcome. So if you wrap all of this together, what does it mean for Fallout 4? Well, I think it leaves the map unbalanced. Fallout's always had a world that's a blend of structured quest activities with unstructured exploration and scavenging. Fallout 4, I think, has a lot of unstructured time. Plenty of areas that serve minimal narrative purpose, but plenty of mechanical value. As a source of junk, you can visit just about anywhere in the game and gain something from your visit. For some people, that's gonna be enough. For others, it's not, and that's a perfectly valid position. There are, after all, a lot of locations across this map that have literally no narrative attached to them. Barely around the corner from the start of the game, Station Olivia has nothing. It's a source of loot and a home to raiders and rad roaches. You will not learn anything else there. Not about the current world, not about pre-war either. This means that the main plot of the game is doing a lot of heavy lifting, as the folks who want a narrative experience are pretty much entirely dependent on these core plot quests. Which means it's time to discuss the story. Fallout 4's core story is built around two connected things, Sean and the Institute. Pretty much everything is tied to these two things, with Sean fading out in the Institute as a whole, taking centre stage as the game progresses. From the moment the introduction ends, everything is about one or both of these things. Where do you need to go? Diamond City, where a reporter is investigating the Institute, and a suspected synth shootout happens on your second visit. On your way there, you might run into a Brotherhood scout team who wants help with a job, which involves a lot of Institute synths. The only person who can help you with your search is a detective who happens to be a synth. The person who kidnapped your child is himself an agent of the Institute, though this is pretty much the point where everyone stops pretending to care about Sean. After Kellogg dies, even the main character mostly talks about infiltrating the Institute rather than specifically finding Sean. Then the Brotherhood shows up, looking to start a war with the Institute. The only person who can interpret the data in Kellogg's brain is a doctor, who happens to help Institute synths escape. Your only lead is a former Institute scientist. He can only help you if you kill an Institute courser. The only person who can decode the courser chip is a member of a secret militant anti-Institute group. And then you're either working for the Institute, pretending to work for the Institute to help the railroad, or working for the Brotherhood and assisting with preparing for war with the Institute. It's absolutely everywhere. No matter what faction you choose to help, everything circles around the Institute. For the first act of the game to work, the Sean plot has to work. For the whole game's narrative to work, the Institute has to work. Unfortunately, both have some serious issues. For Sean, it's not hard to figure out the problem. 
He's a baby. He can't speak. He has no personality. Strong writing and solid voice acting are pretty critical for making a connection with a character in a game. It's why I like Nick Valentine, say. He's a snarky bastard who has a great line of dry comebacks when people insult him for being a synth. What the hell is that thing doing here? Not what your parents used to say to you? Maybe this works better if you're actually a parent and thus the anxiety of something potentially going wrong with a baby in your care is more real to you, but I think it's noteworthy that most games that assign you a kid that you have to protect or rescue pretty universally don't go for babies. Hugo in A Plague Tale Innocence is 5, Daniel in Life is Strange 2 is 9, Ellie is 14 in the original Last of Us. Most games go for an age where the child can speak and thus have a personality. And strangely enough, Fallout 4 agrees, because when you get sort of Sean at the end of the game, he's been aged up to around 10. So why is Sean a baby at all? Because I can't see a single narrative reason. If Sean had just been 10 from the start, everything still works the same. He still grows up in the Institute, the time passing plot twist still works, it's just now the synth Sean actually looks like Sean, and you could actually give Sean enough dialogue to try and make a stronger connection between the player and him during the intro. Seriously, why is Sean a baby? Especially when apparently no one at Bethesda can come up with a baby that doesn't look like... this. To be honest, there's not really a huge amount more to say about Sean, because when you meet him again as an old man, you don't have any meaningful relationship beyond being a direct blood relative, so he's basically a brand new character. Some guy who shares a dismissive disinterest in the Commonwealth with the rest of the Institute. But the idea he's been indoctrinated by his upbringing can be one round to your way of thinking never really comes up. One thing I did find particularly disappointing was they didn't do anything with the idea of him being similar to you because he's your son. My immediate reaction on seeing what they were doing with Sean was that it would make sense if his behaviour changed based on your own. If you were playing as a high intelligence character, he would be smarter too. If you resolve things more peacefully or more violently, then he would be more peaceful or violent. But again, None of that. Sean and the Institute are actually part of a very linear story, where you have no real agency in terms of shaping the Institute around you, which is especially odd given by the end of the game, you're literally the boss of the place, but everybody still treats you like the intern. In fact, let's talk about the Institute in general, because uh, the Institute is weird. You see, as I was saying last time, the factions in Fallout 4 are actually pretty elegant, insofar as their missions really suit the ethos of each faction. The Brotherhood are militants on Crusade, so their missions are violent. The Railroad are secret agents, so their missions feature stealth and disguises. And here's the big issue, because the Institute are just a bit confusing. Like, you spend the entire game up to entering the Institute hearing repeatedly about how the Institute is kidnapping people and replacing them with perfect replicas. It's got people terrified. It's why the Brotherhood invaded. It's what the Railroad wants to sort out. So you'd think that their main plot thread would be something to do with replacing people with synths, given that's literally the one thing we've been repeatedly told they do. But no, they actually want to make a reactor work because they don't have enough power to be self-sufficient, because they hate the outside world and don't want to be involved with it. They just want to seal themselves off. And okay, I mean, you have sent a lot of robots above ground for a group that doesn't have any interest in the world above ground. Ah, but you see, that's because they had to. They needed to steal power and resources from above, which you'd think might mean that if you just got the reactor working, then they'd stop going above ground and everybody would be happy. But no, you still see their forces everywhere afterwards because they still need to scavenge resources. So they still need to be sending teams above ground, which they did previously to seize power production. So their whole main story is basically pointless. Now, you might well be asking why they needed to replace leaders in various societies around the Commonwealth, right down to the smallest groups. Like, literally, the holdings you set up, the odd person who joins them, a tiny farm with only 10 workers, they can be infiltrators sent by the Institute. In Far Harbor, say, it makes sense for Acadia to do this, because the factions are on the brink of war, and pose a real threat to the safety of Acadia. But Diamond City doesn't pose any threat to the Institute. They're a basic agricultural society with big walls and a few traders. All you do by replacing people is draw attention to yourself, which is why the Brotherhood attacked you. Don't forget, of course, that another reason they're kidnapping people is to turn them into super mutants, which they did as part of a rather poorly explained experiment into making better synths. But like, after they figured out that was dumb and wasn't going to work, they kept kidnapping people. 
and turning them into super mutants. For decades, actually. And nobody ever explains why they did. They also, rather than terminating the super mutants when they were done with them, dumped them above ground. Presumably using the teleporter, because that's literally the only way in or out. Which uses huge amounts of energy. Energy that they're apparently desperately short of. Oh, but wait, there's more! Let's talk about the third generation synthetics. These are the ones indistinguishable from humans, because they basically are humans down to a cellular level, just built out of artificial bone muscle, etc. Now, the game says they were developed because the old Gen 2 robots weren't sophisticated enough. They needed better, smarter machines. Hence, Gen 3. But the Gen 3s had a problem. They were now so human, they often decided they didn't like being slaves and ran off. And uh, this happens a lot. Ten years before Fallout 4 begins, the Institute was tracking these runaways down as far away as Washington DC, as seen in Fallout 3. There's an entire faction dedicated to helping those that escape. There are since towns dotted about further up the coast, like in Acadia. The problem is so big that an entire institute department was set up to recover the runaways. And uh, just a reminder, their agents all need to be teleporting in and out too. So that's a lot of energy being wasted, constantly. And a lot of attention being drawn to the institute too. It's a lot of effort, basically. The third generation has been a huge source of trouble. Which does make it rather odd that nobody, anywhere in the game ever explains what they actually need the Gen 3s to do. They just sit there. On occasion, a couple get identified as janitors or similar. That's it. Everything else is done by the old Gen 2 robots. Every single scavenging team, Gen 2. Soldiers, Gen 2. Overall, at a vast cost of time, energy and human life, the Institute managed to find a way to make somebody who can sweep the damn floor. Because here's the funny thing. Just about any time that anything remotely difficult needs to be done, they don't send a Gen 3. They send Kellogg. They send him to University Point, they send him to Vault 111, they send him to Diamond City. And as soon as he's dead and you're in the Institute, they start asking you to do all the same sort of work. Because the entire senior staff of the Institute tacitly agree that they'd much rather send a person than a synth to do literally any job. So why did you bother making the Gen 3s? And this is pretty much in the Institute's DNA. They do everything in the most ludicrously unnecessary way possible. For example, they want to do an experiment above ground with some genetically modified seeds to see if they grow better when exposed to the radiation in the soil and the air. Okay, so how would you put that together? Well, you could just sell the seeds to one of the many homesteads around the Commonwealth and then monitor them. Or, if you wanted a bit more control, you could pay the farmer to exclusively handle your crops on condition they only hand the produce over to you. Or, for complete control, just go to any of the huge amounts of empty land in the Commonwealth and set up a little farm out of the way where no one would have any reason to look for it. But oh no, 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 no. Surely it would be much more efficient to find an existing farm, kidnap and murder the farmer, a man with a family, replace him with a perfect copy, and have this guy deal with the farming. And when I say perfect copy, his children specifically mention he's acting differently, and the foreman successfully determines he's a synth, leading to an armed confrontation. You could have just set up a new farm. You didn't need to infiltrate the Warwick homestead. There's no shortage of bloody land. It's post-war America. It's huge and empty. So, yes, the Institute's a bit of a mess. Every other faction, it's really obvious at the highest level what they want and roughly how they want to achieve it, which is how you end up with missions that feel appropriate to that faction's operation. But with the Institute, an odd mess of isolationism and sort of slavery and constantly messing with the above ground world for no well explained reason, there's no core to build missions around, so you just end up wandering all over the place. One mission you're fighting raiders to get a synth back, the next you're gunning down the Brotherhood to get a technical component, the one after that, and this one is utterly mad, you actively go out of your way to broadcast an announcement about your plans over the radio. Which is of course what I would do if I wanted to be a self-sufficient isolationist science centre that didn't want anything to do with the outside world. And then, the final insult, you take out the Brotherhood in a massive explosive assault to make their giant robot blow up their own airship. Now, 
you may currently be thinking, hang on, don't the Railroad and the Minutemen both deal with the Brotherhood in a very factionally appropriate way? And wouldn't it make hugely more sense to engineer a plan to infiltrate the Brotherhood and replace Elder Maxon with a synth? Because replacing people is literally what we spent the first two acts of the game hearing about. Yes, yes that would have made sense. But no, actually. Basically, the entire game is built around a faction that makes no bloody sense. Right, so as you may have noticed, Fallout 4 does have some problems. Like, some fairly big problems. So, uh, how do we reconcile all of this? How do I evaluate this game after all the stuff I've said during this video and during the last one too? Well, uh, let's try and see if we can figure that out. Fallout 4 is a flawed game. That's absolutely clearly demonstrably true, and I never went into this looking to persuade anybody otherwise. But I do think it's flawed in a few interesting ways, and very unfortunate ways too. In ways that mean, I think, some folks can come to a more negative impression than Fallout 4 perhaps deserves. If I had to try and estimate, at the very highest level, what happened that caused all of this, I suspect Bethesda overcorrected. Knowing full well that Fallout 3's clunky shooting wouldn't hold up in 2015, they brought in expertise from id Software to make a solid, well put together shooter system, and it does work very nicely, and is balanced against a brilliant iteration of VATS that genuinely lets players exclusively treat the game as a tactical shooter RPG if they wish. They wanted a looting and crafting system to form a compelling core gameplay loop. And I think they made a beautifully well integrated one that teaches you to act like a Fallout prospector, they wanted a building system that let people leave their own mark on the wastelands, and I've had great fun making stuff with it myself. And again, it's well integrated into the Fallout world, allowing those who prefer to build to have their own ways to make money and get hold of junk and supplies. And this was all new, it was exciting, and I think these were strong additions to the franchise. But maybe Bethesda got a bit overexcited with all the new toys, and took their eyes off the ball when it came to those who were veterans of New Vegas or Old Fallout, who would be coming in with a very specific set of features they wanted to see. Towns, which are not so common in Fallout 4, and introduced strangely late. Quests, with a strong narrative focus, which do have a less prominent place in the game than Fallout 3, and much less than New Vegas and a character build system that facilitates narrative roleplay. An unfortunate absence from Fallout 4, which does allow, in gameplay terms, perhaps the most specialised unique character builds in the history of the franchise, but then, bafflingly, didn't allow those same specialised perks to be represented in dialogue. But the biggest error, and the one that I think condemned Fallout to be poorly thought of by quite a few folks, is that the first couple of hours are a bit of a mess, that feel like they were desperately trying to excite and engage those who were used to something much faster paced than a Fallout game ever should be. And that decision left us with an opening which... Well, I have every sympathy if you were an old veteran of Fallout feeling let down, because that intro was specifically not made for you. Traditional Fallout quests are dotted around the map, hugely superior to the violent rush through Concord, but you wouldn't know that from the first few missions, which make the strange decision to introduce you to the world with flavourless radiant quests. Building starts to unveil its practical utility in the world, as you start running caravans, summoning reinforcements, and calling down artillery, but you wouldn't know that from the first Sanctuary quest, which completely fails to mention any of the real benefits of towns, like the production of sellable surplus goods. Once you put a bit of time into crafting, learn about what components are found in what items, the looting system becomes a lot more interesting, because you can loot much more efficiently and productively, but you wouldn't know that from the first few missions, because the game basically never bothers to tutorialise looting and weapon crafting, which is particularly odd given it's pretty much the core gameplay loop. All the worst bits of Fallout 4, gunplay without context, mindless unproductive building, essential NPCs who don't have much to say, a lot of chatter about a baby I don't care about, radiant quests, it all comes in the first couple of hours, and I suspect a big reason a lot of folks immediately got off on the wrong foot with Fallout 4, which is such a shame, because most of that stuff fades away over time and gives way to a much stronger mid to late game, especially once you get into exploring Boston and getting to know some really interestingly put together factions. Just, you know, not the Institute. If, however, you are one of those folks who walked away from Fallout 4 with a bad impression, what would I suggest? 
Well, first, give the DLC campaign Far Harbor a try, as it pretty much solves every problem in Fallout 4, and I do mean that very literally. It even integrates some perks into the dialogue system. The writing is much stronger. There are some really interesting characters. There's a very strong reputation system, which feeds really nicely into a strong bunch of quests including a vault-based murder mystery, with almost no raging quests and a huge number of proper subquests with actual narrative to them. As a standalone Fallout experience, it pretty much fixes everything I've been discussing this video. And beyond that, the survival mode, which is a huge revelation as far as I'm concerned, to the extent I can't really play Fallout 4 without survival mode anymore, because it doesn't feel like the complete game. You see, Fallout 4 is full of stuff that feels a bit incomplete, Areas with no narrative to impart, or dialogue with no way to represent your character choices. Survival mode is a feature that, by contrast, fills in some of these gaps. The world of Fallout 4 actively makes more sense with survival mode enabled. To some, settlement building feels a bit pointless in Fallout 4, but in survival mode, having a series of outposts where you can eat, drink, and rest, never mind the other advanced features your towns can unlock if you go down that route, that's a lot more valuable than it is in the base game. There's also the Institute Teleporter, which the Institute graciously lets you use to teleport around the Commonwealth as long as you work with them, which is staggeringly pointless in a game with fast travel where you can just teleport anyway. But when survival mode disables fast travel, the ability to teleport instantaneously from anywhere in the map back to the Institute, that's a ludicrously useful benefit, one strong enough that it's a compelling reason to play nice with the Institute for as long as possible. And then there's the Brotherhood Vertebrates, another thing that looked really cool in the E3 trailer, but then turned out to be completely useless, because you could only fly between two locations you'd already discovered. So again, why not just fast travel? But now, this is a hugely advantageous tool, taking the place of fast travel in a way, and a solid practical reason to back the Brotherhood in the mid-game. These changes actively help the factions make more sense, feel more distinct, and provide unique practical benefits which alienating a faction will leave you without, really strengthening Fallout 4's already decent faction system. Down on the ground, meanwhile, balancing rising adrenaline versus the need to sleep and save is a really tense high-risk trade-off. The massive reduction in compass icon range makes the game much more about exploration, and adding in negative consequences for the use of Stimpaks and Radaway adds a huge amount of value to towns, your own or all the existing ones, as doctors suddenly have a point in existing. It sadly doesn't fix the intro mind, but it does at least make it a bit more tense. But I'd say that, ladies and gentlemen, is enough. I'm glad I chose to look at both sides of Fallout 4, though, because I feel like I've gained a renewed appreciation for the good stuff, as well as a better understanding of the bad, and a great deal of sympathy for those who once played a few hours of Fallout 4 and then chose to walk away. It's an odd game, a flawed game, but in the end, if you give it a chance, it might just surprise you. I've discovered new stuff while researching this video myself, so uh, with all of this fresh in mind, uh, I think maybe it's time for a brand new full Fallout 4 series very, very soon indeed. But in the meantime, I've been Jonas, has been many a true nerd, and Fallout 4 is better than you think. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Ah, we have got a gate key here, and then we have got a... I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake, I've made a mistake! This is going to take all of my skill and cunning as a hunter to sort out... Die, you moving bastards! Die! Die! Go, go away. Go away, nobody likes you. That was a good idea till it wasn't.